Hello, welcome to the EPG Pathshala program in linguistics. I am Pramod Pandey, Professor, Center for Linguistics, Jawaharlal Nehru University. I am the principal investigator of this project. We are now going to listen to a discussion of a module from the course Introduction to Pragmatics and Discourse Analysis. The coordinators of the course are Professor Intiaz Asnan, Aligarh Muslim University, Aligarh, and Professor Rajneesh Arora, English and Foreign Languages University, Lucknow campus. Listen to the discussion. Sorry. The name of the module is Speech Event Analysis, and the authors of this module are one, Sayyid Gurfam Hashmi from the Department of Linguistics, Aligarh Muslim University, and Dr. Raman and J. Kumar Upadhyay, Assistant Professor, Department of English, GLA University, Mathura. Listen to the discussion. Today we will discuss the module Speech Event Analysis from the course Introduction to Pragmatics and Discourse Analysis. As the title of the module suggests, we will try to understand the concept of speech event analysis in this video. Delheim suggested that any communicative use of language or speech event is constituted and analyzed in eight distinct factors, each associated with a different function. We will analyze a speech event uh, in this video. The present analysis comprises a speech event consisting of people from two socio-culturally and politically different communities. So this speech event analysis is um, of an English movie titled A Passage to India based on E.M. Foster's novel by the same name. We will be taking a two minute scene from this movie for our analysis. Uh, so the text that we are going to analyze uh, begins with a gavel pounding in line number one and it ends with a laughter in line number 14. So this will be the particular text. Uh, portion which we will be considering for our speech event analysis. The text is transcribed using simplified notations for conversation analysis. The analysis is done after each speech act. Sometimes two or more speech acts appear to be so inextricably linked to each other that it is uh, fit to analyze them in continuation. The setting um, is a court of city magistrate in district Chandrapur of colonial India. The participants include a judge, lawyers, police officer, accused, victim, audience, court attendants and clerks. The instrumentalities is made up of speech, uh, the message form which includes spoken English, gestures, fa facial expressions, vocalic nonverbal. Uh, and nonverbal speech like hammer and gavel pounding. So, and the topic of this particular case is uh, that the case is against an Indian uh, named Dr. Aziz, and he is accused of violating the dignity of a young English girl misquested. So, before going to the analysis, it is suggested that you watch this particular video clip so as to understand the analysis better. I hope you all have watched the video. So underlying the event is a complex set of socially recognized rules which can be most easily recognized by considering possible breaches of them. For example, um, in the video it can be seen that the audience stand up on the gavel pounding and the police officer stands up and talks upon seeing the uh, judge nod his head. Now just imagine what would have happened if these cues weren't conveyed. Imagine what if the audience still continued to talk even after the pounding of gavel. Or imagine um, what if the police officer did not um, understood the meaning of judge's nod and he instead of standing and talking, talking he just sat there listening to the audience. What would have happened? So, um, we'll discuss more on this before going into the analysis. Let's try to have an understanding of speech event and speech situation. A speech event is embedded into a hierarchically higher unit speech situation and is itself composed of a smaller units called speech acts. 
So one example uh, Del Himes gave of a speech situation and event and a speech act is that um, imagine a party and that party is a speech situation. You have many people in the party, many uh, topics are being talked about and um, so imagine that a party is a speech situation and uh, the conversation that happens during the party is a speech event and um, a joke within the conversation is a speech act so you have a broader a wider scenario that is a speech situation and the conversation in that speech situation is a speech event and the part of that conversation is a speech act now um, interviews buying and selling goods in a shop sermons lectures and informal conversation are examples of speech events in this analysis of the um, the court of the city magistrate provides a speech situation and this speech situation is made up of several smaller speech events which we'll discuss later Each speech event can be described and analyzed ethnographically in terms of its components which uh, Delheims captures in his mnemonic device that is speaking. Ethnography of communicative event is a description of all the components that are relevant in understanding how the particular communicative event achieves its objectives. So Delheims identified uh, 16 components that need to be distinguished in speech event analysis under ethnographic approach to communication. Um, we will not be discussing all the 16 components but we will uh, have a look at the important components of speech. Uh, important components of speech. So first we have um, the setting and scene. Setting refers to the time and place, that is, um, the concrete physical circumstances in which speech takes place. Scene, on the contrary, refers to the abstract psychological setting or the cultural definition of the occasion. So, basically, setting refers to the time and place, that is, uh, the concrete physical circumstances in which the speech takes place. And scene, on the contrary, refers to the abstract psychological setting or the cultural definition of the occasion within a particular setting um, of course participants are free to change scenes as they change the level of formality that is they could be angry they could be laughing or they could be just passing a joke so all this can happen within the scene Now, if you're looking at our uh, speech event analysis exam, the example, uh, this particular scene in the court, this speech event analysis takes the court of the city magistrate as its setting. And the event uh, is situated in the district of Chandrapur in colonial India. The time is in day, uh, probably some part of morning before noon. On one side of the judge's seat was a door labelled magistrate's office and the door on the other side is labelled jailer's office. A shield within, with a sign of the British Empire was on the wall above the, uh, ab above the judge's seat. So the court proceedings make up the scene. However, during the prosecution's arguments, scenes are found to shift in order to relate the past events. Next important component is uh, participants. Himes argues that um, threefold division of a speaker, hearer and the topic postulates a dyad that is speaker, hearer or uh, source destination, sender, receiver and or an um, addresser, addressee situation. However, there are certain situations that require specification of three participants that is um, addresser, addressee, hearer, source, spokesman, addressees, addresses, etc. The participants include uh, various combination of speaker, listener, addresser, addressee or sender, receiver. 
now um in this particular scene again that is uh, the scene in the court the participants in this speech event are uh, we have a judge and a city magistrate a senior police officer um the accused prosecution and defense next component is ends um ends refers to uh, the conventionally recognized and expected outcomes of an exchange and uh, all it also refers to the personal goals that participants seek to accomplish on particular occasions so the former is what himes calls as outcomes and the latter as goals so um outcomes is uh, the conventionally recognized and expected outcome of an exchange and then we have goals that is uh, the personal goals that participants seek to accomplish on particular occasion so uh, both outcome and goals they may not be in harmony all the time in fact they often conflict each other emphasizing this demarcation between outcomes and goals haim says that uh, the purpose of a speech event from the community standpoint may differ from those of the participants as in the event of litigations where both uh, where both parties desire to win similarly a trial in the court of law as is the case in the present analysis has a recognizable rec recognizable social end in in view but the various participants that is uh, the judge jury prosecution defense accused witnesses and audiences have uh, audience have different personal goals for example uh, so for the judge uh, his goal is to uphold the law to determine the truth to evaluate the acceptability and validity of the arguments of, by the prosecution and the defense to establish guilty to establish quantum of punishment and to pronounce a sentence so that is a goal of the judge and when we look at, at uh, the prosecution his goal is to argue and impress the judge so as to establish the accused guilty and to secure maximum sentence for the accused and uh, in case of the defense lawyer his goal is to argue and impress the judge so as to establish the innocence of the accused and to secure the acquittal of the accused and when we are looking at the audience we can see two kinds of audience we have the indian audience and the british audience so the indians would like to see the accused be pronounced innocent and be acquitted the british would like to see the accused be pronounced guilty and his subsequent conviction so um yeah as we mentioned earlier both outcome and guilty will not always be in harmony and they are often uh, conflicting each other next we have um, act sequence act sequence refers to the precise words used how they are used and the relationship of what is said to the actual topic at hand so um so yeah act sequence refers to the precise words used in a particular speech event and how they are used and the relationship of what is said to the actual topic at hand the former is labeled as a message form and the latter as message content many serious errors occur when um, there is a mismatch between form and content and this is because we ignore the fact that uh, caught and caught how something is said is part of what is said so for example uh, you cannot be apologetic or mourning while putting a broad grin on your face people will not buy that okay if you if you are sincerely apologetic then you will have that kind of an expression which convinces the other person that you are genuinely apologetic about what has happened or you are genuinely sorry or for example you cannot be talking out loud or you cannot be laughing at a funeral and this um if your action does not go by the event then it contradicts mm. 
another important uh, component of speech is uh, key key refers to the tone manner or spirit in which a particular message is conveyed so key means uh, key refers to the tone manner or spirit in which a particular message is conveyed key may enter the analysis non verbally by participants behavior gesture posture or even the kind of clothes they wear um delheim stressed that when it is in conflict with the overt con- content of an act it often overrides the latter so in this analysis there are instances when the key is in conflict with the overt content of the speech act which we'll see later then we have instrumentalities instrumentalities refer to the choice of channel for example oral written telegraphic uh, or other medium of transmission of speech it also refers to the actual forms of speech employed such as uh, language dialect code or register that is chosen um formal formal language written or legal language is one example of instrumentality now when you look at the particular speech event that we are analyzing you can see various a variety of instrumentalities for example um, you can see verbal different kinds of verbal speech that is uh, we can see uh, spoken english written english and uh, we can see the writings in latin court documents files and books also we can see non verbal uh, acts such as eye movement facial expression gaze body posture etc um non speech sounds like gavel and hammer pounding visual semiotics like statue of justice union jack shields etc and uh, dresses like uniforms of police lawyers judges and the civilian clothes uh, in which the audience has have come so all these are instrumentalities that can be seen in a particular speech event another important component of speech is um, norms of interaction and interpretation so as we know norms of interaction refers to uh, the specific behaviors and properties that attach to speaking that one uh, for example one must not interrupt while others are speaking or uh, maybe let's say uh, you are attending a church mass and you want to convey something you don't you just don't shout it out loud but instead you whisper you you convey it very silently so there are certain norms that you are expected to uh, follow in certain situations so um norms must be observed while uh, saying say paying a visit to a place of worship attending an academic event an exhibition theater or a political gathering and other situations so you are expected to um, behave in a particular way in a particular at a particular place norms of interpretation refer to how the norms of interaction may be viewed by someone who does not share them this may lead to misunderstandings or a complete breakdown in communication there are similarly different interpretation associated in different cultures with loudness silence gaze return and so on next we have genre genre refers to uh, clearly demarcated types of utterances that depend on the kind of speech event one is engaged in uh, proverbs riddles sermons prayers lectures and editorials each represent distinct uh, genres jo- uh, genres fit for particular occasions and uh, in the particular speech event that we are analyzing here it uses mostly legal english with serious key sometimes it includes sarcasm and mocking as well now we will uh, coherently analyze the speech event uh, from the movie a passage to india we'll do a line by line analysis and um, so here the first line is of gavel pounding 
so the attendant in the courtroom uh, is pounding the gavel on the table thrice so what does this mean and what uh, what is the importance of this act in this particular speech event we'll see that now a servant standing in the court pounds the gavel it is a form of non verbal communication which has a serious legal key this communicative act may be analyzed within both instrumentality as well as act sequence with gavel pounding forming the uh, form of communication while content to which it is related is an announcement of the arrival of the judge so that the things fall to order the typical norm realized in this process is the order to rise as a show of respect to the judge the norm is concurred by all the participants apparently there seems no mismatch in the expectation to follow this norm although one section of the participants that is uh, the indians they might probably not like to rise at the arrival of the judge but still they do concur with the norm possibly so as not to offend the other participants or be accused to challenge the institutional authority of the court now we'll move on to the second sentence that is uh, the city magistrate saying das is a good man mrs totten now um, the city magistrate uh, is interest is an interested party to the case he uses uh, spoken english as instrumentality with serious key uh, the norm of addressing a married english lady with the title mrs is adhered to Uh, the key used is serious but the form of act sequence does not literally convey the message content it is used to satisfy the concern of mrs turton that uh, his absence as a judge today might influence the outcome of the trial mrs uh, turton ronnie and uh, miss quested are the participants now this speech act is in reference to the uh, previous speech event now we'll move on to the third sentence that is uh, the judge nodding to the police officer um the judge the deputy to the city magistrate is officiating the business today uh, the instrumentality the instrumentalities comprises of papers documents files and books on his large desk um and by nodding he uses a non verbal uh, action with serious key as a message form as well as one of the instrumentality to order the police officer to rise and produce the argument the other participants comprise the audience the norm inherent in this speech act is adhered to by the police officer as he takes the cue and rises next we have the police officer saying uh, thank you sir so conforming to the norm of the previous speech act the police officer rises and produces his arguments he uses spoken english with serious key as the instrumentality a slight bow uh, is also used redundantly along uh, with the speech as a mark of respect and gratitude in honor of the judge no other instrumentalities are used um, in the domain of speech the message form uh, sir is used as title of the address in english to someone who is higher in rank of authority um, this message form also encapsulates the norm as it is considered an expression of gratitude and formula to begin the argument in many institutional settings including the court of law there are no mismatches between form and content and the norms of the various participants so everything is followed and everything is perfectly fine until now again uh, the fifth sentence is uh, spoken by the police officer so he starts with on april 3rd of this year so we'll be taking just this particular string of words the instrumentalities used in this act is uh, spoken english with serious key the speaker likely tries to uh, evoke the norm of established formula for factual description in legal domains when he begins his talk with the exact factual date 
which is probably why he is uh, saying on April 3rd of this year. So you want to be factually correct and um, the speaker by referring to some past event brings about a change in the same. The setting however remains the same. Now we will uh, go on to the sixth sentence which is again spoken by the police officer. It goes like this. Miss Quested and Mrs. Moore were invited to a tea party at the house of government college's principal. So here, um, no other instrumentalities except spoken English with respectful serious key are used. Um, following the English norm, the title Miss and Mrs. are used to address and show respect to an unmarried English lady and the married English women respectively. The speaker invokes Mrs. Moore, a participant who is not present. There is no mismatch between message form and its content. Neither there is any incongruity between norms of the speaker and the hearer. However, the Indian participants may not identify with the norm. Further, um, a tea party may not be normative to the Indian participants and therefore a fuller appreciation of what constitutes a tea party may not be reached by them because Indians are not familiar to the concepts of tea party or addressing um, married women to, as Mrs. and an unmarried woman as Miss is probably not so familiar to the Indians and hence they may not fully ap uh, appreciate what has happened. Now again we will be looking at the sentence delivered by the police officer which goes like this. Here the prisoner first met Miss Quested, a young girl fresh from England. Until this party the prisoner had never been so close to an English girl. So what happens here is that uh, the speaker uses spoken English with serious key as a message form while the declarative forms the instrumentality. The intention to use this message form is to evoke the underlying content of establishing guilt of the accused. The speaker brings forth the norm that it is thought inappropriate and beneath the dignity of the whites, uh, particularly white women, to be in the company of the orientals. The real content of the message is not in harmony with its form since what the speaker is trying to emphasize is that a uh, young white girl will be an object of desire for the oriental men. This understanding is not captured by the declarative nature of the officer's speech. As such, uh, the speaker is relying on rhetorical aspect of speech. The allusion is to the past events and therefore leads a change in the scene of the event. Next, we will look at sentence number 8, which is again uttered by the police officer. In consideration of the ladies present, I will merely allude to the fact. So, we will be taking again taking this particular sentence spoken by the police officer for our analysis. So, here what happens is that uh, again the speaker uses spoken English with serious key. Um, the message content evoked by the form are uh, excuse and circumvention. This speech is a reminder of the fact that it is normative in the presence of women that the certain talk considered as inappropriate should be avoided or strategies to circumvent it, it to be used. Uh, the speaker is trying to rely on euphemism to prescribe certain use of language which falls under the domain of taboo. Then we have uh, sentence number 9 which is again spoken by the police officer which goes like that he is a widower living alone. So now here uh, again the police officer is using spoken English with serious key. The speech is declarative but is used to establish guilt by exploiting the social belief that a widow has sexual desires to be fulfilled, which is why he is saying that he is a widower living alone. This proposition is not parallel to the ends expected by the accused and the Indian participants, 
but it is in accord to the prosecution and to other English participants. Now remember that we had mentioned it earlier that the goals or the outcome, uh, the ends of uh, each participant in a speech event can be different. So here the ends, uh, while the police officer is saying this particular center, sentence, uh, the Indian participants do not expect it. However, the British or the English participants do expect this kind of an end. Then we have uh, sentence number 10, which is again spoken by the police officer. In presenting our evidence, I'll provide ample proof of his state of mind. Again, spoken English with serious legal keys used both as uh, instrumentality and as message form. It is used to prepare the ground for arguing and establishing guilt of the accused. Registers like proof and evidence suggest to the legal uh, genre of the event. Such a use of speech also highlights the norm that proof and evidence are admissible to the court of law rather than uh, unsubstantiated opinions and beliefs. So precisely every single word and every single action you make or you uh, you do consciously or unconsciously are relevant in a speech event now uh, we'll move on to the next sentence uh, before going through the history of this appalling crime i want to state that state what i believe to be a universal truth the darker races are attracted to the fairer but not vice versa so now here when he says that the darker races are attracted to the fairest but not vice versa, the police officer's tone is uh, he is slow, emphatic and determined while saying this. So he is trying to convey his idea, he is trying to establish this. The speaker uses spoken English with proverbial seriousness as key. It is used to render his arguments acceptable. Uh, and the genre that the speaker tries to evoke is proverbial since uh, the hue he provides to his opinions are presented in a fashion similar to a proverb but in a fact-like manner by using a declarative. In so doing, uh, the speaker also attempts to convince the jury about the guilt of the accused. There is an evident conflict of ends of various participants. We'll now move on to the 12th sentence uh, delivered by the defense lawyer and it goes like this. Even when the lady is less attractive than the gentleman, so this is a question and um, here again the instrumentality of spoken English evokes a sarcastic key in the speech act. The form um, of the message is a question. The content evoked, however, is sarcasm and disagreement with the police officer's proposition. It also serves to mock the belief and absurdity of such an opinion held by the officer in particular and the English in general. The genre evoked in this speech act is that of a joke and as a consequence induces much laughter and mirth among a section of participants who do not concur with the proposition. However, Given the differential goals that uh, the various participants seek in this speech event, the English participants find this speech act disgusting as is evident in their non-verbals. The judge on the other hand, given his concern for the ends and to maintain, the, um, and, to maintain and enforce the norms of the setting is also irked by the fuss created by the laughter which is reflected in the following sp speech act. Now, soon after this, soon after this, um, you know, um, laughter in the courtroom, the judge says order and he pounds the hammer. Two message forms, uh, apart from kindnesses, proxemics and facial expressions are used in this speech act, namely uh, spoken English and nonverbal hammer pounding, both of which are used to issue order to maintain silence. The key is serious and legal. Hammer pounding together with speech 
is used as a norm to control the behavior of the participants. So uh, he pounds a hammer and then he says order. So both the hammer pounding along with speech is used as a norm to control the behavior of the participants. The norms evoked are the assertion of authority, order to maintain calm and silence in a court of law. The norm is challenged by one section of the participants and is violated by their rupture into cracking laughter. The text uh, concludes by the laughter of, an, of the Indian audience. They, they keep laughing and clapping their hands in the courtroom. So the instrumentalities and message form used are vocalic, non-verbal, facial expressions and gestures. The content meant to be evoke humor and mocking. Further, it is likely that it might be used to subvert and challenge the foreign role of law in specific and enslavement of India in general. For when uh, evoked in a court of law, it serves to mock and is a display of violation of authority of the institutions maintained by the colonial rule. And uh, the genre here is humor. By analyzing this particular speech act, I hope it helped you in understanding the difference between a speech act, speech event and a speech situation. Uh, also with this particular illustration, we also learned uh, the relevance of various speech components in a speech act such as uh, setting, scene, norms, ends, um, genre, keys, etc. Summary. So you have written, listened to the detailed discussion of speech event analysis. In this module, there has been an attempt to analyze a speech event, which consists of people from two socio-culturally and politically different communities. This speech event analysis is of an English Hollywood movie, A Passage to India, based on E.M. Foster's novel by the same name. In talking about speech event analysis, it is necessary to see that it has several components and how these components can all be separated and analyzed in the course of the analysis, speech event analysis of different linguistic texts.